Well, welcome back to the Azure podcast. This is episode number 394, being recorded on the 15th of September, 2021, with special guest Maria Mihailova. I'm Sajid, and on teams with me, I have what's our special guest, Maria, uh, Kale, and Cynthia. And we're going to get to our special guest in just a minute uh, on a really interesting topic, which we haven't covered in a while. So look, looking forward to getting the latest update on that. But before that, let's uh, look into some of the news in Azure this week. And I believe, uh, Kale, you put a few things, as did Cynthia, or oh, maybe just uh, Kale. And I have yeah. some to cover as well. I think Evan is not here today, but he put some, which I'll cover. Yeah, sure. I got uh, three of them here today. So the first one is about the well-architected framework um, kind of practices and patterns and things like that that we've kind of built over the years. And, um, you know, we've talked about this a few times uh, in the news and on the podcast. Uh, I think we even had some guests on about this, but um, essentially uh, the thing I wanted to call out here for our listeners is on September 23rd uh, this month, there's online on this uh, Learn TV. Um, we're gonna have, you know, some presentations there and uh, kind of behind the scenes of the uh, the framework documentation. I think uh, Mark Rosinovich is going to be delivering the opening uh, address uh, for that. Um, so feel free to, uh, we'll, we'll drop the link in the notes, but you can RSVP to that. Uh, it's online, so there's no like in-person thing. Uh, and there's a write-up there about some of the uh, different sessions uh, that are going to be talked about, cost optimization, security, reliability, uh, with various you know, representatives from Microsoft, uh, from PMs and engineering uh, in there. Totally free, so uh, check it out. Second thing was around video analytics. I think we talked about this one a few times too, and also with our discussions around 5G uh, that we've had a few episodes on uh, the Azure for operators. If you go back and look at that uh, podcast we had, and in here, this is basically talking about, you know, the uh, analytics platforms that we've built there, uh, primarily that help in the 4G, 5G space. Um, and, you know, the investments that we're making in there, various, you know, partners we're working with. Uh, I think there's even some case studies in there uh, on this, uh, which is really cool. So if you're uh, in that space and building around uh, large scale live video feeds, things like that, which the Azure podcast someday will be a live feed. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, but, uh, you know, <clears throat> we have some really good stuff there in our Azure Video Analyzer, Azure Arc. Um, this Microsoft Rocket, which I don't know too much about, we might need to, uh, you know, have a podcast about that when to dig into that one because I don't know too much about uh, Microsoft Rocket, but it sounds really neat, uh, the open source platform for uh, video processing. And then the last one was around, um, this is more traditional one around just some services in Azure. It was around the Azure Firewall. So there's been some updates uh, in August. So we're in September now, but it was uh, you know just last month. And there's some new features there, regional expan expansion, some things around premium SKU for uh, certificates, uh, availability zones, things, and some things around uh, public IPs like force tunneling and not. So uh, if you're using Azure Firewall, uh, or interested in that, uh, take a look. There's some new enhancements there. That's all I got. That's great. Uh, I have a couple that Evan actually put in there, so I'll cover them for him. Uh, so the first one was about uh, the uh, Azure Disk Storage. And uh, now what's generally available is the zone redundant uh, storage. So uh, instead of being limited to just being re uh, locally redundant in a data center, it's uh, redundant across all of the data centers in the region, and that should make them much more highly available. So that's uh, one thing to look forward to. The second one, which is uh, particularly close to me, I know Kendall would have loved to talk about it if she were here today, and that is about AKS, uh, the scale down mode in AKS. As you know, AKS has a way where you can scale up and scale down, but the problem is when you scale down, uh, your uh, node underneath is completely allocated, you know, the storage is gone, now, when you have to scale up again, it's got to have to recreate that node from scratch all over again. And so now there is a new feature in AKS where you can say, when you scale down, uh, get rid of get rid of the node, but don't delete it completely, right? Don't delete all the uh, the storage uh, associated with it. Next time when it comes when it's when you think you need to scale up, now it's a lot faster because you're just spinning up the node and the storage is already ready to go, and you can be up and running. Uh, in a, in just you know maybe a couple of minutes instead of the five or ten minutes that it takes today. So 
I think this is a good uh, a good uh, a good service to have because uh, you know you still save money by not having the uh, the VM running. Uh, of course, there's a few pennies that you have to spend for the storage to keep that going. But uh, you know, uh, for the most part, you're meeting your uh, your price uh, goals over there. So, so Sajid, is that like akin to you know what we had a long time ago with VMs, where we would shut them down versus deallocate them type thing? Exactly. It's just done automatically through the scaling mechanism in AKS now, you know, so because you normally don't have access to that feature manually. It's done by behind the covers mm -hmm. when AKS feels it needs to scale up and scale down. And so there's a flag that you can turn that on now. Nice. Well, uh, Cynthia, do you have anything or should we just get to our special guests? OK, sounds good. Well, uh, Again, uh, thank you, uh, Maria, for reaching out to us uh, to talk about your favorite topic. Uh, so please uh, first introduce yourself to our listeners and uh, tell us what you do at Microsoft. We'll take from there. Yes, yeah, thank you for having me. So my name is Maria Mikhailova. I'm a principal software engineer at Microsoft Quantum. Uh, in a nutshell, Microsoft Quantum is working on building a full stack quantum computing a system and the ecosystem around it. So all the layers from quantum hardware to uh, algorithms and applications. Um, myself, I'm on the very top of the stack. I uh, drive our education and outreach work. So helping people learn quantum computing using our tools, helping people learn our tools and uh, ideally making these learnings exciting. So, you know, I wanted to ask you, like, what is, uh, as, a, as a developer, like I'm a C-sharp developer, for example, and I'm sure, you know, Kayla and Cynthia have their own special languages as well. But for a developer, uh, what's the hardest thing to get over uh, if you want to get into quantum computing? The hardest thing to get over is probably the reputations that quantum computing acquired over the years. So. If you just kind of think about what you've heard about it, probably sub subconsciously, you probably think that it's like scary and hard. It's actually not. <laughs> Under the hood, it's all linear algebra. And it's really not the worst <laughs> branch of mathematics you could work with. Linear algebra and a bit of probability theory. So, Somehow, over the years, it acquired the reputation of being inaccessible and spooky and whatnot. So this thing is what I suspect just keeps a lot of people back from learning it and understanding it and just being comfortable with it. Once you've stepped over this, everything else is just technical stuff. It's easy. Okay, so I have a question because I've I've asked someone about this and they try to explain qubit to me. So in quantum computing, do bits not exist anymore and everything is in the unit of qubits? Hmm. That's a new way to pose this question. So bits still exist. Uh, but they exist in a different capacity. Bits are no longer the main way you perform your computations. Instead, they are the way you are getting the output of your computations. And your computation is done using qubits. Qubits are basically the things that carry out your computation for you. They, they are really interesting because they're not just kind of um, different type of memory they are actually what carries out your computation based on the instructions you provide to them. But if you think about them as memory, you probably heard this idea that a bit has only two states, zero and one, and a qubit has also the superposition states. Uh, it means it can be in any state between zero and one. If you think about it as a circle on a plane, you have horizontal, you have vertical. But in that's in classical. In quantum, you also have all the states between. Uh, so this is a very <laughs> unhelpful description of what a qubit is. The really interesting things happen when you have multiple qubits, because then you can 
act on states of multiple qubits that are also between all the basis states, linear combinations of the basis states. And then you can have all kinds of interesting things when you measure the results and when you manipulate them and you have something that looks very much like negative probabilities. They are not actually negative probabilities, but basically probabilities of different states can cancel out. So once you get over this, it's really easier to do it with pen and paper and some precise mass than by just talking. But once you get over this, the idea behind quantum computing is that your algorithm manipulates the state of your qubits cleverly so that in the end of the algorithm, you do your measurement, you read out the information from the state of your program and you get the right answer with the high probability because the incorrect answers probabilities kind of cancel each other out. Yeah, so I had another question too that kind of follow on to what Sajit had mentioned earlier. So um, thinking a little bit more high level, uh, less directly on qubits and some of the low level internals, like where does, uh, what should I think about from like a workload perspective? Like obviously I don't think it's like something where I'm going to run my website using quantum computers behind the scenes, you know, to surface up a, a marketing site or something like that. But what should I think about? Like what are the sweet spots for like, hey, if you have a workload that meets this kind of criteria, quantum is like a powerhouse that can really help you. Excellent question. A very commonly held misconception is that quantum computing is going to overtake everything and replace classical computing and you're even going to check your email using it. Uh, not going to happen. Just let's just stick with Outlook. So the sweet spot for quantum computing are things that classical computers are bad at. Classical computers are decent at checking emails. Uh, Quantum computing is good for things in which you have a little input. Then you have massive computation to be done on that input. And then you have a little output. A great example is uh, quantum chemistry. It's uh, simulating the properties of uh, molecules and materials based on the information about their composition. So it takes relatively little information because you basically tell what atoms are in the molecular, what are the distances between them, that kind of things. So it's not a huge amount of data. But then to simulate something like the energy of the ground state of this molecular, it actually takes a pretty big computation. And the size of this computation grows very fast as your molecular becomes more complicated. So, for example, classical computers can model caffeine, really important molecular, right? They can do it perfectly because it's small enough. Once you go to slightly larger molecules that have, for example, metals in them, things become much more complicated and classical computers cannot model them any longer. And you need to model these for all kinds of applications like uh, fertilizers, like uh, medical applications, like coming up with new materials. And this is something that quantum computers we expect are going to be good at doing because of this kind of, as algorithms for quantum computers are different because there is this affinity between the quantum processes in the molecules and the quantum processes you're relying on for performing your computation. That's one example. You know, Maria, when you described earlier about how uh, I think you were answering uh, Cynthia's question about uh, uh, you know how uh, how you would actually run one of these programs, and you said that uh, you know the outcome has a high you, you have a high probability of getting the correct answer on the outcome. I think that's how you explained it, right? Because all the incorrect answers kind of cancel each other out, and that is one of the you know again that goes back to the question I was asking. That's like difficult for me to wrap my hands around, right? Because when I write a program, I want to know that I got the answer. Uh, and what you're explaining is that you know there's a high prob you you have a high probability of getting the right answer or or something of that nature. And that's like I, I want to try and understand, like you know, where, how does that uh, change how developers should think about, you know, approaching writing 
uh, a quantum computing program. If I have a traditional program, uh, you know, maybe it's a, you know, I think of neural networks or something like that, right? As uh, as a kind of a classic example of a complicated algorithm. And I want to do that in using quantum uh, computing. Uh, how, what's the mindset change that's required over there? Uh, if you have only worked with deterministic programs before, there is going to be some mindset adaptation required, but there is a class of algorithms that is probabilistic inherently, even so they are completely classical. So you just, uh, basically you don't trust the first answer you get, uh, you run the program a couple times more and uh, you pick whatever answer is uh, most frequent one. That's a very simplified version, but uh, it's not that uh, conceptually different from classical probabilistic algorithms. Awesome. Maybe you could talk a little bit about um, kind of how we develop on top of this. Um, you know, has Microsoft created like their own language? What sort of pieces are kind of open source here in that space? Like how are the communities and Microsoft working to uh, push quantum forward? Um, and how can I like start writing code for this uh, on these platforms? Oh, this is a big question. <laughs> <The one. laughs> yeah, OK, I will fit the answer in the rest of the time we have. <laughs> OK, so. Uh, what does the workflow of developing a quantum application look like? And then I will seg into answering the rest of them. So uh, there are a couple of main pieces that go into it. So first you develop your program kind of locally on your computer, same as in classical computing. Uh, for this, uh, Microsoft has um, a set of tools called Microsoft Quantum Development Kit and a programming language called Q-Sharp. It's a domain-specific language. It has lim very limited capabilities for classical computing. For example, you cannot read a file using it. It's very targeted specifically at quantum computing algorithms. So you write your program using Q-Sharp. Then you uh, run some validations on it. Uh, and one very interesting tool that comes as part of Quantum Development Kit are quantum simulators. Those are classical programs that uh, behave like a small quantum device. So they can uh, simulate the behavior of your program without actually hitting quantum hardware, which is really convenient because this means that using your old laptop, you can uh, run programs that take up to 30 qubits. And this means that you can do neat software engineering things like developing unit tests, right? We all know that it's an important part of our software engineering practices. And this is something you want to do for quantum computing as well, especially since your results can be probabilistic. You want to verify as much things as possible locally. Now the next step, once you have convinced yourself that your program is correct, you use another tool called resource estimation. Uh, you run your program through it to figure out how much uh, hardware resources it's going to need, how many qubits and how long your computation is going to take. Basically, current hardware systems are first small and second prone to noise. So if the computation is too long, it's just going to be messed up by the noise. So uh, by the end of it, you're not going to get a useful result, unfortunately. That's the negative thing about being so early in this quantum computing space. The hardware systems are just too small and too noisy right now to give an actual practical advantage, but they're great for research. So once you have convinced yourself that your program is correct and it can run with the hardware that you have access to, you go to Azure Quantum and um, you, the last step is running your program on actual quantum hardware using uh, the cloud, Azure Quantum. We have a couple of hardware providers right now, INQ and Honeywell. 
So you have your peak of how you want to run your program. So in this uh, workflow, uh, which pieces are open source? Um, pretty much everything until you hit Azure Quantum is open source. So Quantum Development Kit is open source, uh, Q Sharp language and specification, mm, the simulators, the learning materials, uh, pretty much everything there is open source. And how you can get started with uh, writing your quantum code? I believe that was the last piece of the question. Uh, we have uh, a lot of great learning materials. We have uh, MS Learn modules that help you get started on the quantum computing path. And we have a dedicated project that is my brainchild. It's called the Quantum Cutters. They're basically a collection of tutorials that come with programming exercises. So you get the theory and then you get the programming exercise. And when you write your code, uh, the a tutorial gives you feedback. So it tells you whether your solution is correct or not. And again, you know how important it is to get feedback when you're learning, especially if you're doing it on your own. <laughs> Actually, when I started learning quantum computing, we didn't have any of those programming tools. We didn't have the quantum cutters, of course. So the learning at that point looked like, here's the book, read it, good luck. Really hard to learn things that way. So when I got to the point of exercises in that book, I would have to basically mm, set up an ambush at the kitchen. It was a couple years ago, so meeting people in the kitchen of your office was actually a thing. And I had to wait until an actual quantum computing researcher would wander into the kitchen. And I was like, oh, hey, you're a computing researcher, right? Certainly you know the answer to this exercise. Um, it's not something that every learner can do, especially if they don't have places with high traffic of quantum computing researchers nearby. So that's actually how I came up with this idea, something that would give you the feedback for your solutions automatically. So Maria, I, well, I really hope to be in one area with high traffic of quantum researchers. That sounds like a cool place to be. Um, but I've heard that quantum can help in things like um, in the pharmaceutical industry, that it helps with development of drugs, that the computation is a lot faster or things can done, be done in parallel. How, how can we understand that information? Like what about quantum that makes these computations faster? Fundamentally, it's that thing that I mentioned before that you kind of consider multiple options at once. It's the superposition thing. Mm, but okay. then you manipulate those options so that the ones you're looking for have higher probability than the ones that are not answers to your problem. Uh, it's really tempting to say that it's just considering everything at once. But that's not entirely correct because the way quantum measurements work, you can kind of consider everything at once, but you wouldn't be able to get all the outputs for every input. You're going to just get the output for one random input. So instead, you need to have this algorithm that's going to manipulate your inputs cleverly to achieve this consolation. It's called interference. The, like some things canceling out and other things amplifying each other. I had a question about the dev environment too. So like as you talk about like, hey, you you build your stuff locally, you, you kind of test it and, and things like that, and then eventually uh, you work your way up to actually running it on quantum hardware. Um, what happens, so like I, I assume like at the production scale, like once you get up into quantum hardware, this is where your actual simulations or whatever you're running your code on is happening there. The um, question I have is like, what happens when things like crash there? And what I mean by that, like, um, 
let's say we had a bug in our program or something, what's like the debugging experience like for quantum? Is it like vastly different from like, you know, I'm used to you know, using Visual Studio or VS Code, we can set breakpoints, we can look at things. Can we do the same thing in quantum or is it like, no, there's a whole new way to do debugging like thing? Definitely a whole new way. So the thing about quantum computing that makes it really, really hard to debug. First, uh, the way it works physically is that you have this very complicated system in superposition state. But if you try to look at it, because that's what you want to do when debugging, right? You want to see what's going on. Uh, when you look at it, the system is actually fragile. It's not going to show you what's inside it. Instead, it's going to collapse. It's uh, the the way the physical process works. It's going to destruct this uh, superposition state. It's going to uh, become just one of the components of this state. And it will show you just this one component. So basically, if you have this incorrect superposition state, you're not going to be ever able to observe it. Makes debugging a pain. True. So that's why we want to emphasize the local development so much. Because when you're developing locally on a simulator, the simulator is a classical program. It pretends to be a quantum device, but underneath it's a classical program. So it can tell you everything about the program, including things you wouldn't be able to observe physically. So when you're running on a simulation, you can use uh, uh, parts of this experience, Visual Studio and breakpoints, yes. And it can show you the quantum state at these points. Once we are hitting the hardware, it's going to be really hard to debug. There are some research directions about how to actually gather information if something went wrong. But this is a research area, not something that we have a ready-made answer for you yet. And, and real quick, I know you got your hand up, but I just had one follow-up question to that. Like the compute that's used, and I don't even know if we know the answer to this. Anybody knows, that's why I just want to ask it. Like. When, we, when I look at like traditional compute or even like a GPU today, um, they behave a certain way under certain conditions, right? Like as you mentioned uh, before, right? So like uh, the heat, right? So the, the heat inside the computer will uh, actually affect like how the compute works, right? And if it gets too high, things start to break down, right? We start getting errors or other things will happen. Is that like w what is happening with quantum like today to kind of make it stable because it's like for instance i assume like if you're running some big um, like cancer calculation or like uh, cynthia mentioned like some new drug development or, or molecules and things like that that that's going to take a long time to run probably it's going to be a lot of data and that's probably going to develop significant I guess heat. I, I guess the question is like, is that where a lot of research going in to make that stable? So it's just like a light switch, like, hey, here's my program. Two hours later, I come back, I get the output. And, you know, does it, is it really finicky, like with that kind of stuff? Oh, yes. It's so much more fragile than the classical computer at this point. So qubits um, can have multiple physical implementations. Uh, different companies pursue different uh, things usually. But all of them are incredibly sensitive to environment settings, environment noise, like <laughs> air conditioning turning on and off in the room in which your fridge sits can impact your computation. Terrible stuff, really. So that's where a lot of hardware research is going into right now, figuring out ways to make the qubits more stable, less sensitive to that external noise and to make them uh, scalable. So right now, the, the biggest systems in the world have less than 100 qubits, I think. And to have your real practical impact, you want to have millions and tens of millions. And building a system that can have that many qubits and have them uh, with low noise so that you can actually carry out your two hour long computation is a lot of challenges. Maria, one of the things that I've heard, and maybe it's just uh, you know science fiction here, but I've heard that uh, if the bad guys get a hold of a quantum computer, they could crack like an RSA algorithm or something very quickly. You know, it's it's got that power to do something 
a bad like that. I know that you know when we deal dealt re- with AI and ML, we had to put a certain ethical boundaries around you know how we use that sort of technology. Are you guys thinking about that in a similar way when it comes to quantum computing? Like, you know, is there like an ethical way to use quantum computing? <laughs> uh, there definitely are some uh, dangers to it. You can use pretty much anything unethically, right? Oh, specifically for this uh, question, the RSA breaking. This is unfortunately not fiction. With a big enough and stable enough quantum computer, you can break RSA. Uh, this is why uh, there are uh, researchers who look into coming up with new schemes for making things secure that would be resilient to quantum computers. I think there is actually a team in Microsoft who is looking into this. Awesome. Well, uh, I mean, it's, what's the what? What are your kind of go-to uh, action for this? Like, what should our listeners do first? Like, where should they go to to try this out? Mm, uh, the best place to go is uh, Azure Quantum uh, website, Azure.com/Quantum, I believe, which is the entry point to read more about all the great work that Microsoft is doing, and also a pointer to our learning materials, of course, if you want to, you know, dive in and get your hands dirty and start actually writing quantum code. Uh, there are pointers there, and personally, I believe the quantum katas are great. At least that's what people tell me. <laughs> Sure, they are. And uh, I know you said there's a good open source uh, community around this. Uh, is that is that where you you and your team will often go to answer questions and things like that? How can how can they you know developers get? I'm sure they have like you know all those newbie questions coming out uh, with something new like this. What's their avenue for getting help in these areas? Yeah, we definitely are working on building a community around our tools. It would be sort of silly to have a functioning quantum computer and great software tools for them, but nobody actually being able to use them. So uh, everybody is most welcome on our open source repositories. Uh, We watch uh, Quantum Computing Stack Exchange, for example, in which people often come and ask questions about Keysharp. So those kinds of other news. We also sometimes do events in which we kind of engage the community a bit closer. And the one that's coming up is going to be Hacktoberfest. Uh, you know, uh, having some good first issues for people to uh, contribute to our open source repositories. And- I just have one like future thinking question for you. If if you were to look into the future and say, you know, when is that point in time where I would be able to have a quantum computer right back there by my wall, uh, maybe a small uh, quantum computer? When would that become a reality? Like how many years into the future are we talking about? Well, you know what they say, prediction is hard, especially about the future. <laughs> Right now, our thinking is that uh, quantum computers are going to remain in the cloud for a good long time. This lovely screen, the background that I have, is actually uh, a lab in one one of our European labs. And uh, that's kind of what it looks like to have a fridge that has a very small quantum computer potentially sitting in it. Is that liquid Gently. nitrogen next to it, the two tanks? Um, quite possibly. They never allowed me to look inside, <laughs> which is very wise. <laughs> yeah, I'm a very software person. Um, so having something like that sitting in your bedroom first requires a seriously big bedroom. And second, uh, it's expensive and it's fragile and it has a lot of maintenance going into it. So having it somewhere in a dedicated lab and giving you cloud access to it is uh, pretty much the best way to do it. Same as supercomputers don't sit in people's uh, spare bedrooms. They sit somewhere and they get access via cloud. Good question, good answer. I thought that's what the Xbox mini fridge was, Sajid. 
I thought that was like four quantum. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, that's good. That's a great, a great answer. Thank you so much, Maria. Well, if you have, yeah, we'll take all the links and you know resources that you have uh, to share with our listeners, including all the work that you've done to make the the learning uh, easier. And we'll put it along with the show notes. Uh, so feel free to send everything my way. Sounds good. All right. And thank you so much for reaching out again and taking the time to explain to us uh, mere mortals what uh, quantum computing is all about. You know, we don't we don't hang out with the cool with the cool quantum scientists and researchers. So uh, yeah, we this is our, our way of trying to learn. Thank you uh, for having me. It was a great chat. Thank you. Thanks.